Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Governor John Carney. Thank you for joining us for our weekly press conference on Delaware's response to, to COVID-19. Uh, this past week, uh, we've been concentrated on uh, two uh, situations in our state, uh, the week-to-week -week, uh, attack of COVID-19, as well as uh, the severe weather uh, events that we had over the past week, uh, last Tuesday. Uh, the, the, most of the damage and the tornadoes were centered in in central Delaware, uh, in Kent County, outside of Dover, on the way to uh, Smyrna and, and Middletown. Uh, A.J. Shaw, who's here with us again uh, this week, the director of DEMA is going to talk about that in a minute. We're also joined by Dr. Uh, Carol Wate, uh who's with us again. So we've got our, our normal team up here today and just uh, an update on storm uh, response. I did uh, speak with Delmarva Power just uh, before uh, this press conference and was advised that the vast majority of service has been restored here in northern Newcastle County. I know those uh, customers and, and our constituents have been out of power for several days and uh, we appreciate your patience with that. Very severe damage with uh, lots of trees down, particularly in western uh, Newcastle County, stretching from, from Greenville around uh, towards the Concord Pike area and even east to the Delaware River. So I believe we had confirmation of a t tornado, a touchdown uh, there on uh, on Friday and certainly experienced significant uh, winds and damage uh, in the city of Wilmington and, and Brandywine 100 and, and west uh, towards uh, towards uh, Newark and Pike Creek. So with that, uh, AJ, you want to give us an update there and, and where we stand today? we Will do. So uh, thank you, sir. Definitely a very eventful week weather-wise. We had the tropical storm Isaias that came in in the week, and then on the uh, on Friday, uh, knew we had the uh, potential for some severe storms, and had two storms that uh, merged together in the northern part of the state, northern northwestern part of Newcastle County, and really created a, a rainmaker as well as a tornado. Uh, one few areas that the University of Delaware. Uh, Environmental Office report out on it received over an inch of rain in five minutes, which is of historic levels. So going back to Tuesday's tornado, we have had three confirmed tornadoes in Delaware in the last week. Uh, just so you know, our average over the last 50 years is one per per year. So very eventful and, uh, you know, a very se severe week. Uh, the National Weather Service is, has their preliminary reports out with three. There may be more that they're still looking at. Uh, radar images, they were on the ground here last week one day and also Saturday, as well as we provided them some aerial footage for them to, uh, you know, look at that and make their final determination. So on Tuesday, we had the one that came from Kent County up through, uh, you know, northern Kent County into southern and central uh, Newcastle County. Went 29.2 miles, so uh, kind of something that you would expect to see in the Midwest and not necessarily in Delaware. Uh, substantial damage with that again I mean hundreds and thousands of trees that have been knocked over we understand that debris removal is uh, one of the huge issues right now and we're working with our uh, state legislators we're working with the uh, solid waste authority with DelDOT with others to see what if anything we're able to do to assist because it, it is you know we understand people have insurance we also understand there's a gap there as well so we're trying to see how we could as assist um, with that Luckily, uh, with our partners, and when I say partners, I'm talking about the uh, power companies who uh, really did a remarkable job. You know, we had 60,000 power outages at the uh, peak of the Tuesday event. They got those down to just about nothing very quickly. They were wrapping up operations on Friday, and then two hours later, uh, ramped back up when the system came through uh, northern Newcastle County. Uh, our partners at DelDOT, the fire service, I won't tell you how many fire runs were uh, responded to between Tuesday and then Friday's events for either damage to structures, tree into a house, water rescues, etc. But commendable work by uh, all those responders that were out there. And then let's not forget our volunteer organizations that we work with uh, every day, the uh, VOAD, so the Volunteer Organizations Active in Disasters, the American Red Cross that was able to provide sheltering for uh, several families that had uh, no place to stay and help them, uh, you know, on their the path to recovery, as well as the uh, health and social services, not that they're already busy with the uh, pandemic, but they're helping individuals that, you know, have needs that are, have a gap right now. Um, so then we go to Friday's event, uh, very quick 
uh, event within between about 5.30 and uh, 7 o'clock. You know, a lot of rain in uh, the Hocassin and Greenville area. Again, a lot of tree damage and another tornado. And again, their weather service is still looking at something a little farther east in the county as well. So, uh, you know, if anything, th this is hopefully reinforces uh, a few things for people. When you get the weather alerts, whether it's on your phone, on TV, you know, or, or radio, you know, seek shelter. You know, tornadoes are not something we want to... Uh, you know, take the chance of that it's not going to hit you. Uh, secondly, we ask people, you know, I said a few weeks ago, you know, we got to make sure people are prepared. Uh, state works on our plans. We need the individual to do what they can do as well to lower that risk. Um, and then lastly, kind of what I will uh, lead up with two things is uh, Kent County, Newcastle County are working with a lot of organizations to try and get help out to those people that need it. Yesterday, we uh, teamed up with a nonprofit called Crisis Cleanup. Uh, the numbers right there 844-965-1386 and the uh, emergency manager for the city of dover case ass has done a remarkable job working tirelessly the last week and one thing was how do we get our heads around who needs help and how do we triage it well that's where crisis cleanup comes in so anybody in delaware right now um, could call this line register kind of what their needs are uh, there's no guarantees we're going to be able to assign people to it but between the volunteer groups like team rubicon america red cross and some others are still trying to get in state to help at least we could understand what the needs are out there and uh you know get a better picture of what's going on um lastly we've had a lot of questions about will this be a presidential disaster declaration uh, we are doing damage assessment uh, we've been doing damage assessments since last wednesday uh, we have 30 days from the date of the incident to request that uh, through the governor to the president of the United States. Uh, there are certain thresholds we have to meet to uh, request that. We are trying, and again, both these incidents are separate. So what happened Tuesday is one <coughs> incident, what happened uh, Friday is another. Uh, but we will go through, we're you know, doing our damage assessment at the counties and the uh, local municipalities. We're taking as much information as we can from our partners to see what, you know, position paper we could put together to try and, uh, you know, get the assistance to people. And, and a lot of times, uh, you know, that doesn't come for 30, 60, 90 days. But we're going to do everything we can to uh, put that argument together and then uh, discuss it with the governor as uh, we collaborate that information. So in closing, uh, there's still, you know, over two months of uh, hurricane season left. And uh, I, I think we can't underplay it, especially there's fatigue amongst, you know, a lot of uh, our you know volunteers out there and the the, the responders and uh, you know we need to make sure everybody takes this stuff seriously so sir back to you uh thank you aj and thank you for uh, your team and their good work and uh thank you uh for recognizing all the uh, workers uh, for del dot they did a tremendous job i was out uh, touring the various damage on sunday uh, and on wednesday of last week uh, city of dover we appreciate the partnership there uh, and we're extremely lucky. The damage that I saw, particularly there uh, south of Dover, around Moores Lake, uh, we're lucky that there weren't more injuries and fatalities. We did sadly have one fatality uh, in, I think, the Milford uh, area. Uh, and so to just take those precautions that are necessary. I did talk to a lot of my neighbors uh, there in, in the neighborhood I live in, in Wilmington, that, that uh, got into the basement as they got the warning and was the appropriate thing as we saw trees fall on houses and uh, which could have uh, really uh, injured people in a very serious way. So thank you for that. Again, thanks to the, to the uh, first responders, uh, again, to Del Dodd and the crews that were out there uh, working uh, so hard uh, over in the heat uh, on Sunday and over the weekend uh, so that we could get uh, folks back, the partnership that we have with, with Del Mar of a Power and getting our roads cleared and opened and uh, electricity, electric, uh, back to, to homes that had lost power. So thank you to all the folks uh, that were involved in that, and a thank you to all the Delawareans who were affected uh, for, your, for your patient. This is really an, an unprecedented situation. Uh, it's something I, I haven't seen in my lifetime, the kind of destruction, back-to-back -back storms like that. Uh, we averaged maybe one tornado a year. Uh, we had three in, a, in the course of a week uh, with the uh, tropical storm that went through and the summer storm after that. So let's go to our data this week. Uh, the numbers are looking good uh, this week. Uh, total cases are, are flattening out. Uh, they are continuing to rise, I guess, at 16,000. Still 186,000 negative tests and 
while our number of lives lost is, continues to, to slow, each life is, is precious and we continue to lean into protecting our vulnerable, particularly senior citizens and those uh, in long-term care facilities. Uh, hospitalizations is, continues to be a strong a point uh, where we uh, are down to 35 current, which is a, uh, one of the lowest levels that we have, have had since, uh, since March and the beginning of the, the, the pandemic here in Delaware. So we look at the cases across uh, the state, or the positivity, 3.8%. Uh, uh, again, our target is to be under 5%, and so we're moving uh, solidly below that. Uh, we're down to 65.6 .6 new cases per day on the seven-day moving average. That's considerably below uh, the gating criteria for quarantines in New Jersey, New York, and, and Connecticut, which we talk about a lot. Uh, that cutoff is at 97, so comfortably below that and expect to hear that uh, we're once again off the, the lists in our surrounding states. 7,200 uh, new cases or, or cases overall in, in Newcastle County uh, and, and staying about uh, on, the, uh, you know, a, a reduced uh, level of, of increase. Uh, same with Kent County uh, and Sussex County as well. So we've, we've pushed down the outbreaks that we've seen uh, in Sussex County. Things are starting to flatten out. Again, if you look at the demographics, though, you can see that that young, uh, uh, young adult demographic is where we saw that acceleration in late June and early July, and it continues to increase at a rate greater than all the other uh, subcategories. So again, we need folks uh, that are in that uh, young adult demographic to think about being careful uh, when you're in bars and restaurants, when you're in public spaces, wearing masks, and, and being serious about uh, protect, protecting your neighbors and yourselves from, from the virus. Uh, here's our data dashboard. Uh, again, hospitalizations, you, we've got every one of our, of our indicators on a, a good 14-day downward improving uh, conditions. Uh, current hospitalizations, again, one of the lowest levels that we've had uh, in the last five months. The new hospitalizations, uh, they tend to go down on the weekend, tick up a little bit on, uh, on Monday, and that's what you're seeing there. Our percentage of, of people who are testing positive uh, continues on a, on a nice improving, improving condition and, and decline. So we're at about uh, under 4% there on our seven-day moving average. New positive cases, again, as I mentioned a minute ago, uh, are decreasing as well. And then you can see uh, the classic uh, peak uh, and then improvement, the flattening of the curve. The little uptick that we saw after um, uh, once we started uh, opening, uh, particularly in the beach communities. If you look at the 90-day view, you can really see this current hospitalizations consistently moving down from the peak of 337 uh, back in the the last week of April. Our new hospital uh, admissions tend to to be up and down, as you can see in the top middle chart, and then the percentage of people who test positive. Again, the peaking, then the decline. The little increase there that we saw back in, in the June, July associated with uh, mostly with beach bars and restaurants and people going back to uh, vacations. And then we flatten that curve out nicely and have, uh, again, pushed down the new positive cases on the bottom far left, uh, consistent with our efforts to get folks to wear masks and to to observe uh, social distancing. This chart uh, is uh, the percentage of persons who, who test positive over the, uh, since late March, uh, the beginning of, of uh, this, this spread of the virus in, in our state uh, with a peaking at the end of April. That was the high point of our hospitalizations as well at 337, then uh, a very pronounced uh, decline after that uh, in through May and until June 1st, where we started to reopen again, saw the little uptick in the end of June, uh, driven mostly by uh, beach communities, and then we've effectively pushed that down again, and we're on that downward trend. And that's really where we want to, uh, to stay. We want to uh, continue to get better, to improve conditions on the ground with the focus on getting 
our children back in school in the fall in a way that's safe for teachers and staff, uh, children alike, and that we can uh, reopen and get businesses back online. Here's our data dashboard for PPE, personal protective equipment. The glasses uh, are all full, and uh, AJ, I think we're doing pretty well there. We've already shipped out. We get a lot of questions about PPE. For school personnel, we've shipped all that out to them, and Correct. so they should be ready to go Correct. with PPE. And, and so, much of, so much of our effort uh, today is focusing on uh, getting children back in school safely, uh, protecting teachers and staff, and enabling uh, parents and, and others to go back to work uh, in person and get our economy moving again. And, and we're prepared to do that and really economically accelerate off uh, these improving conditions in our community. As I said, uh, compliance with mask wearing is improving. Uh, you can see it uh, anecdotally. You know, if we had uh, data and testing, I'm sure it would prove this to be the case that the vast majority of Delawareans, really no matter where, particularly when you're in public, but most places uh, uh, that, that, that I run into folks, uh, I see folks uh, following these guidelines. I think that uh, mask wearing uh, compliance is increasing across our country, certainly in our region. Uh, it's increasing in the, the YMCA gym uh, that I go to. It's increasing uh, at uh, all retail establishments that I they go into when I go to pick up, take out food in a restaurant. Uh, I see I uh, have my mask on, as do the people who are s serving me at the counter, and, and the same is true in restaurants across our state. So a couple of weeks ago, we, we disclosed uh, the conditions under which schools could go back into session uh, in September, and the school districts have been really working hard, uh, superintendents and their teams getting plans put together for their boards. We're clearly in uh, scenario number two, which is the yellow scenario. Two of our criteria, the new cases, uh, on a daily basis at 56.5, which is very strong uh, compared to where we've been in the last uh, month or so. Uh, our target there for green is to get that 56 number to 10. And our percent positives, which continue to be strong, driven in part, AJ, by your team's work in getting more people tested and the testing that's happening in other venues at 4.2% 4, 4 positive. That's not today's number. Today's number is better yet than that at 3.8%. That's the number for, I want to say, Saturday. Week to week, yeah. Week uh, to week. August 1st through August 7th. There you go. So that's going to be our measure for, for the schools, daily hospitalizations, comfortably below uh, the gating criteria there, which is 10 uh, new cases, and we're at 4.3. So solidly in scenario number two, and each of the school districts are in the process of developing their plans, as I said uh, a minute ago, working hard with stakeholder groups. Most districts have large teams of teachers, staff, administrators, uh, parents involved in putting those uh, teams together, and they'll be presenting those to school boards. Uh, most of the boards uh, are still in the process of re reviewing those plans. We do have an example of a hybrid plan uh, that has been improved, uh, approved by the Cape Henlopen School District. Um, here it is, an example of a hybrid plan. Um, families have the option. They're giving families the option. They're surveying their families now. They did a survey earlier. Uh, I think the, about 60% to wanted uh, in-person uh, uh, or mix of in-person and remote learning, and about 40% of their students in an earlier survey one just remote uh, uh, learning so they're going to have a mix uh, of in-person and remote uh, learning families have a choice uh, the elementary schools will uh, have a remote option for parents who uh, select that but they'll be open five days a week for in-person instruction space permitting meaning the configuration of the classrooms they're working closely as all the districts are with uh, personnel from the Division of Public Health have been assigned to each of the districts and working closely on making it safe for uh, children and staff. We know that children are not as susceptible to the virus. Uh, the concern primarily is with teachers and staff. 
there. Um, and of course, then in the middle school and high schools, a remote option for parents who would like that, and then two days per week in person, uh, again, space uh, permitting, uh, almost like a college model, if you will, where you go to class a couple days a week, and then you, you, know, you do your work at home, and you're working on papers and, uh, and other assignments, uh, a mix of remote and in-person instruction. So this was an example of Cape Henlopen School District. You can view their plan at capehenlopenschools.com slash reopening. It's a, a very lengthy uh, document that addresses uh, many of the issues and all the concerns uh, that stakeholders have. And we would recommend it to, to, to you to give you an idea of, of uh, a district has uh, developed a hybrid model, a mix of remote uh, and in-person instruction with uh, family choice. Most of the di districts are continuing to work with their on their plans and prepare them for submission uh, to the boards who ultimately make that decision. Uh, you may have heard this week that the uh, the DIAA, uh, the board that uh, that regulates uh, high school sports in our in our state, has come up with a, a, a recommendation or a plan uh, to delay uh, sports uh, into the latter part of uh, this uh, first uh, semester into December and determine what's happening uh, on the ground. They looked at the various options there, and I think um, in light of the fact that some of the schools and, and high schools will be in a, in a totally remote uh, situation and, uh, and given the, the situation on the ground and the need for transportation and all the logistics of, uh, of uh, high school athletics have moved, like most of the states around us, by the way, Maryland, Pennsylvania, uh, New Jersey, mostly to mostly a similar degree uh, with a, a same kind of, uh, of a decision. So we did announce this week uh, support, uh, recognizing that the additional unemployment benefits uh, from the federal government, the $600 uh, has uh, expired at the end of, at the, end of uh, the month of, of July that uh, we, and that the expiration of uh, the, uh, the action that we took to hold up uh, foreclosures um, and evictions that we've established a $40 million fund using CARES Act funding, uh, thanks uh, to the Congress uh, and the President and our congressional delegation, Senator Carper, Senator Coons, and Congresswoman Bl Rochester. We used $20 million that went to the state and $20 million from Newcastle County to basically recapitalize uh, the DMAP program, what, which was a mortgage assistance program created in 2007 when we had the, the mortgage foreclosure crisis in our state. It was shut down for a while, and now we've reactivated it as long with uh, the DHAP program, the Delaware Housing Assistance Program for those who need assistance, uh, rental assistance, up to $5,000 for those in an emergency uh, situation and the, the the resources goes to uh, the landlord or in the case of a, a mortgage to a an agreement worked out with the mortgage uh, servicer and so if you need information about uh, rental assistance or mortgage uh, assistance uh, you can find it at destatehousing.com slash COVID-19 destatehousing.com slash COVID-19 a $40 million uh, fund uh, with uh, a $5,000 limit uh, targeted towards uh, families that are having problems because the, they're un unemployed, not able to go to work, uh, not able to pay their rent or pay their mortgage. We have uh, some assistance to get them through what we hope will be uh, a short period of time as we get businesses uh, up and running again. And so our focus in addition to uh, responding uh, with our agencies to the two severe weather events that we've had over the past week is to really continue to push the curve down uh, to reduce the spread of the virus, to improve the conditions here in our state with respect to COVID-19, and we're accomplishing that. And we're accomplishing it mostly because, uh, largely because uh, all of you uh, or pay attention to the guidelines and restrictions. You're wearing masks when you're in public. Uh, you're keeping social distancing uh, when you're in public. You're being careful 
uh, when you go into restaurants to, to be separate and follow the instructions. And if you run a business like that, uh, you're following the rules and regulations as well. For me, the overall objective is now we have something very tangible, two things very tangible uh, to target, and that is to get uh, more children back to school for in-person instruction, and two, to get as many businesses uh, reopened and, and doing business uh, in a semi-normal uh, situation, certainly with more normal uh, revenue than before so that they can be successful and employ Delawareans. So with that, uh, I want to turn it over to Dr. Carol Rote. We want to work and welcome her back. She had a couple weeks where some we had other uh, guests from the Division of Public Health, and we want to thank uh, Dr. Hong and Dr. Pescatore for their great work and for filling in as we talked uh, more about uh, testing, particularly testing of teachers and school personnel and and we'll talk, AJ will talk a little bit more about that today. So Dr. Rite. Great, thank you, Governor. Our numbers are looking pretty good, as, as Governor Carney just said. Of course, we would like to see our numbers go down. Um, certainly, we do not wanna see increases in our numbers of cases and our percent positive and our hospitalizations. Uh, for Right now, it looks like we're in kind of a mild to moderate level of community spread. And so again, it's, it's out there, the virus is out there, and it's really important that we do everything we can to prevent spread between individuals and um, especially outbreaks like super spreader events. And so I wanted to go over just some of the latest learnings in the research to, uh, talk about how what we know now to best prevent the spread of this virus masks face coverings we've talked about them a lot and we continue to have evolving growing evidence that says wearing a face covering wearing a mask is the most important thing we can do to prevent the spread of infection between individuals to prevent super spreader events. When you look at some of these events, um, many in different places across the, the country or the world, uh, these super spreader events almost always involve a lack of face coverings. And as we talked here before, I think one of the uh, best case studies of showing the effectiveness of masks was these two hairdressers who saw 139 they served 139 clients very close contact between hairdressers and clients for prolonged periods of time and because everyone was wearing a face covering the hairstylists themselves and the clients no one got the infection so again face coverings are so very important uh, there are a couple of updates in fact in the last couple of days there was a study that came out looking at different types of of masks and so i think it's really important to, to highlight the importance of different of uh the different masks and knowing what works the best face coverings that have multiple layers of fabric which are, is the type that many of us do wear these are the most effective in fact this study showed that these are almost as effective as N95s, which are the high-grade face coverings that um, healthcare providers wear. So these work really well. Um, unfortunately, these gaiter types of neckwear, it's just a single layer of, um, of spandex. A lot of people wear them like while running and put them up when needed. Unfortunately, are not effective. This study showed that these really don't work well. In fact, you may even have an increase um, spread of droplets with these types of face coverings. So we want to make sure people know not to wear these gaiters um, to prevent spread, but really wear the type that has multiple layers. It's also very important that it covers your nose and your mouth, and it fits well around your nose and your, and your mouth. Um, CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, just yesterday put up new guidance around face coverings with valves. I want to make sure people are aware that um, valves um, are um, a, a hazard in that um, droplets 
aerosol can go through the valve, and so it is not protective or preventive in spread of the infection. Additionally, face shields, which many people like um, because you can you can see you can see the mouth. They also cover the eyes, which is good, but alone they are not adequate because they do not cover. They do not do it, have a seal around the mouth and um, and the nose. So important information about that. Also, I wanted to mention medical exemptions. Um, there are a lot of folks who will claim they have a medical exemption to, to wearing a face covering, but the reality is true medical exemptions are extremely, extremely rare. It would be someone who has um, a lot of difficulty breathing, maybe somebody with COPD or serious um, severe asthma, and those are individuals who the science has made very clear are also at very high risk for um, severe consequences of COVID-19. So we recommend that people with those conditions for which they don't feel comfortable without or uh, wearing a face covering, that they really should not be in public places where they are exposed to other individuals anyhow. I also wanted to mention age. You know, we've talked a little bit about this, the American Academy of Pediatrics and the medical, or, um, um, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have, have recommended all along kids two and up. Um, it's strongly recommended. And um, what we are seeing out and about, in fact, I, I just was at the mall recently. Um, I saw a lot of younger kids, um, you know, four year olds, five year olds, very comfortably wearing face coverings. So we are seeing more and more that um, this is becoming a norm for, uh, for children and uh, want to make sure that uh, people are thinking about that as well. Additionally, um, a physical activity exemption. A lot of uh, folks think, you know, if you are physically active in a gym or walking around in a gym or even weightlifting in a gym, you don't need to wear a face covering. Um, really, it's only those who are engaged in vigorous physical activity, um, which is running, um, or running fast or cycling fast. Um, stair climbing fast, um, where your heart rate is really increased. Those are really the only times when you shouldn't be um, wearing a face covering, and that's especially when you're when you're indoors. When you're when you're outside and you're distanced, um, it's fine to walk or bike without a face covering. But we want to make sure that folks who are in gyms um, lifting weights um, know that they really should be wearing a face covering because that is a, a risky behavior. Uh, the World Health Organization recently came up with a really nice document around um, ventilation. So I wanted to touch base on, on this. This is, as we have seen over and over again, a really important factor for these super spreader events. And um, so in all indoor environments, um, workplaces, schools, churches, um, anywhere that people are spending time indoors, it's really important to make sure that there's fresh, clean air and on the next slide, we talk a little bit about um, HVAC systems, which are um, really important. A well-maintained HVAC system can reduce the spread of COVID in indoor spaces by increasing the rate of air exchange, reducing the recirculation of air, and increasing the use of outdoor air. It's also very important to check HVAC systems and change filters regularly, whether it's in our home or workplace or churches or any other uh, any other place where people gather. Also, um, WHO points out that restaurant rest room facilities, the exhaust fans in these are often not um, fully functional. So it's important to have these checked out as well to make sure that they are operating at full capacity. Uh, but the reality is outdoor air is so very important. So above everything. If you can open windows and doors while indoors, please do so. Um, but very importantly, use outdoor spaces as much as possible for all kinds of activities. And finally, I want to touch base on singing, cheering, loud uh, speaking, voice projection, yelling. Um, we've talked about that before and we actually have guidance in place. Um, secondary to seeing some, some outbreaks related to, uh, to singing where it was 
assumed that aerosolization of these respiratory droplets was, was happening uh, during these activities. And Evolving Science is, is really showing this to be the, the, the case. I want to um, give a shout out to the Wilmington Children's Chorus and um, Philip Duchette and others who have been sharing with us some of the recent research in this area, which again is, is, is showing that yes, spread does happen from these activities. They also um, shared with us a study that showed certain wind and brass instrumentalists um, like saxophone and tuba and, and trumpet also generate aerosols at high rates. And part of the issue with these activities is they're often inside and they usually do take place for longer than 15 minutes. So you get these aerosols circulating in the air that people breathe and that causes the problem. But there are things that you can do to mitigate the impacts. And so on the next slide we talk about recommendations. Um, we certainly don't want to tell people not to sing and um, or um, in theater to project yourself or in churches or coaches who are yelling. Um, but there are things you can do. Wearing a face covering is the most important thing to do and uh, again a recent study shows that singing with a face covering uh, is a very effective way to decrease the, the, the spread. Of course um, again, we, you, we want to encourage at least six feet apart. If a face covering is not going to be a worn um, with these activities, we strongly recommend staying at least 13 feet away from people, um, facing away from the audience, as well as um, using a physical barrier um, such as a sneeze guard or a face shield to help prevent the spread. Um, additional recommendations include Um, for wind instruments or um, other brass instruments, um, you can use a bell covering on the instrument and a modified face covering for those who are, are playing these instruments. Um, voice amplification um, can be very effective, whether uh, whatever setting you're in, if you're teaching um, or uh, um, coaching, um, using voice amplification uh, makes it so that physiologically you're not exuding the same amount of aerosol. Um, so that can be very, very helpful as well. Um, again, we see a lot of coaches who are pulling down their face covering to yell. And that's the exact opposite of what we, we want people to do. Keep that face covering on and use like an electric bullhorn um, and electronic whistle um, instead, of, um, instead of these other approaches that can spread viruses. Um, also a recommendation that came out of this study we saw was uh, between activities, for example, between choral activities, air out the room for 30 minutes uh, for good ventilation between activities and that can make a difference as well. So again, preventing the spread, we got to stay vigilant, we got to stay home when we're sick, and wearing a face covering or a mask, again, is, is probably the most important thing that we all can be doing, as well as staying at least six feet apart, especially if we are not wearing a face covering, and spend as much time outside uh, as we can, especially if we are around other people who are not in our household. And with that, I will hand it back to the governor. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rattay. Great information uh, about mask wearing. Uh, I say it each week, I think, uh, on our White House calls uh, consistently. The message is if you want to uh, flatten the curve, if you want to prevent the spread of the virus, uh, that we need to increase compliance on mask wearing. I hear it, as I've said before in the past, from Republican governors of, of Florida, of Georgia, of Texas, of Arizona. And now you're starting to see in each of those states uh, their cases uh, starting to trend in the right direction. And, uh, you know, the experts will tell you a lot of that's due to better compliance uh, and focus on mask wearing and social distancing. They are the main tools that we have. Uh, each of us can, can uh, employ those tools, and we would uh, encourage everybody to do that, to take care of yourself, uh, your family, and your neighbors. AJ, you're going to talk a little bit about testing, really continue to have a little bit of a, a, a drop in testing because of the weather, but we continue to really ramp it up and, and it's an important part of our response to COVID-19. No, thank you, sir. And yes, yeah, so uh, 
Testing continues. We did lose a few days last week. I'll talk about that in a second. But uh, this week, uh, again, have about 10 sites up in Newcastle County. Uh, no doctor's orders needed. Uh, you could make an appointment or show up. Or I mean, the good thing is we are not turning people away, uh, you know, during these events. We've been able to uh, accommodate just about everybody that's shown up really since the beginning. So uh, capacity is good. You could go to de.gov slash get tested to find out locations and times that are convenient for you. Kent and Sussex, uh, same URL. You can go to the checkout, and we got uh, four events this week there. Uh, very successful day yesterday in Dover, and I think you know, we're kind of in routine. People know where we're going to be there and uh, getting some good numbers uh, while they're depending, and that leads me into the uh, next thing. So we did see a decline the last two weeks. Uh, we lost about 3,000. We didn't lose. We, uh, you know, we're down about 3,000 uh, individuals last week because I got tested. Uh, testing event um, on texting events on Tuesday were canceled due to the uh, tropical storm. Friday's events up in Newcastle happened to be evening events, and they were all uh, closed early due to the uh, severe weather that uh, rolled through. So we have the capacity. We have the events. You know, unfortunately, we have to uh, deal with the weather as it comes up in. Uh, causes some issues, but uh, we continue and march on. Uh, we're still rotating around uh, to make sure we are able to, uh, you know, get to different communities and, uh, you know, get people tested. Uh, the Walgreens uh, partnership's been working very well, looking in the next few weeks to expand that, and Dr. Taylor hopefully has some information on that in the next week or so. But again, that will give us just a little wider foundation that we go out there and uh, help get out in the community. Um, and then we continue to uh, develop or to look at new options, and that takes us to the school and teacher testing. So, as we announced last week, we are going to be rolling out uh, teacher and staff. So, anybody that works in schools uh, that could be there while students are, including bus drivers, uh, you know, other staff, administrations, etc., will be tested. Have the opportunity to be tested, and then we're going to do about a quarter of them a week, ongoing. So, uh, you know, it's good for surveillance and make sure they're done once a month as well. So. We have, again, expanded the uh, type of testing. We're going to be using uh, another saliva-based test, so it's very uh, you know, easy for individuals to do, and it gives us additional lab capacity. So now we have what the public health lab could do, what we're doing through curative, and now uh, the vault being a, the, the third lab or the, the third component to that. So it's exciting to get that off the ground. We know that's been uh, something uh, the teachers and staff of schools have been uh, you know, concerned about, and hopefully that will make it just that much more safer as we get students back in the classroom. So the second part of that, and something we're working on, and it's a little bit moving target, as uh, Dr. Ate mentioned, and the governor, you know, the schools are presenting their plans right now to uh, their boards to get uh, approval for how they are going to go back. So uh, we are going to greatly increase community testing uh, over the next uh, probably month. Uh, it's going to be, you know, focused around uh, the school district. So we are going to try and have, you know, several days of testing in uh, school districts, depending on the size of the school district, uh, about a week prior to students getting back into the class. Uh, however, right now, you know, this is kind of in flux as we know some school districts are deciding what model they're going with and what date they are going to be going back. So uh, as we get those uh, confirmed through uh, our partners at Department of Education in the districts, we'll be rolling out the, uh, the schedule. And I wanna make sure it's clear that if you are in, you know, you know, Colonial School District, but you happen to be somewhere else today, they're testing there. I, we don't care where you take your kids to get tested. They could go to any one of these sites. They're going to be open for the community as well, but we are going to be, you know, probably doing twice to three times amount of testing for several weeks there. So it's going to be a heavy logistical lift, but we're going to be all over the state concentrating on high schools um, just because they have the footprint to accommodate the uh, drive through and walk up individuals. So more to that. As we confirm that, probably had the first two weeks play, uh, planned out by the end of this week, early next week, and we'll share that with you and also uh, communicate through the school districts so parents see it as they get their kids ready to go back to school. Governor? Yeah, so AJ, uh, great work. Thank you for your attention. I think it was uh, three or four weeks ago I said to you at one of our meetings, I want to test every teacher and every uh, member of the, of the uh, school staffs across our state as they reopen schools and you've got a really good plan uh, to do just exactly that. It's a, a plan that I think will be easy, easy for teachers and staff uh, to make sure that they get tested since they can basically do it themselves at home and register um, with the, the testing company. We'll have those results 
in advance of their coming back into buildings and then we'll teach uh, we'll test them regularly after that and and continue to to focus on making sure that the, the schools are safe places uh, for teachers uh, staff and children we think that uh, we can do it the key is uh, in continuing to uh, win this battle with COVID-19 to flatten the curve to crush the virus as I say is for everybody to uh, to help out by wearing a mask by practicing social distancing by following the restrictions and if we do that we can get our children back in schools we can get back more to a normal uh, way of uh, doing business in our state we can open uh, businesses more fully uh, and we can strengthen our economy and get people back to work. So we're all in this together, and uh, we're going to win this battle together. So with that, uh, again, we thank uh, the media for covering our press conference today so we can talk to the, our constituents and the people that we work for, the people of Delaware, and answer any questions that you have. Meredith, thanks for being with us again. Hello. Um, just to start off, a clarifying question about testing within school staff. Is it required for staff members and teachers to get tested? I just saw has the opportunity. Yes. Yeah, so from the state's perspective and public health, you know, they can't make them. So that's going to be something that's up to the uh, school districts. So it's highly encouraged. We'll put it that way. Oh, OK. So I, I'm just curious. Again, I know previous comparisons with nursing homes, apples and oranges, but I am curious why the state would recommend nursing home staff but not teachers at this point. So I believe there's a licensing and light licensing component to that too. I'm not sure if Dr. Tay wants to add anything more, but I think it's just, you know, the, the school districts are the ones that employ the teachers. And just to follow up on that, does the state plan to publicly track any infections if and when there's confirmed cases in schools? Yeah, so uh, we absolutely um, will be tracking, you know, any infections that might occur in the school setting. It's a part of our um, case investigation work now for every every case. It's one of the questions that is is asked. Um, schools would be considered one of the high risk settings. And um, so whether it's the school that might find out first that there's a positive case or public health, um, we will work very, very closely with the schools with the school district in responding um there may be times when there's really no need for the public to know for example if a person was positive but no one else w uh, would have been considered exposed um that's uh, unlikely to uh, uh to be made public however if there are um exposures and there's reason to um make the public aware uh, we will work with the school, the school district, to make sure that um, people have the information that they may need. And we've we've talked about it quite a bit uh, in these uh, press conferences over the last uh, month or more about our contact tracing uh, protocols and and systems. Obviously, in a controlled environment like this, so those contacts and those interviews are a lot easier to make. It's also something that we're working with the University of Delaware on for similar purposes to, to, to identify people who may have been uh, uh, come in contact with somebody who tests positive. But as of now, there is no plans to have like a running list of schools that have had confirmed cases that would be available to the public? Uh, not at this time, no. And then just my last question um, for the governor. I know there have been reports of the Ohio governor testing positive and then testing negative for the coronavirus. I'm curious how often you get tested yourself and what kind of test you use. Um, I was tested, I want to say, once. It uh, was back. My son has been working remotely and living with us. He, he works for a, a computer uh, science company up who actually does uh, work in the healthcare. Uh, space in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, but they've been all working virtually, and so he was home and not feeling well, and so he was tested, as was I, and uh, my test uh, was negative. I believe that's the only time that I've been tested. I did, I did quarantine once uh, as a result of uh, one of the staff who tested positive and uh, just just served out the quarantine it was not necessary to get tested because I did the quarantine instead. Has any of your other staff members tested positive? Just to follow up on that question. Uh, not that I'm aware of.
This is from Amy Cherry at WDEL. Can Delaware afford President Trump's unemployment, which appears to require states to pay for 25% of federal unemployment? Well, Delaware is going to use um, part of its CARES Act to uh, pay for the unemployment benefits that have already been paid out. And so we, with our own revenues, can't afford that. And we will be taking out a loan from the federal government uh, for our current obligations and, and, and payments that we'd have to make going forward. And so this, uh, this new action, executive order by the president, is very complicated and frankly unnecessary. Uh, that uh, we ought to have had action by the United States Congress. Uh, we thank our congressional delegation for working hard for an agreement there to extend within the current framework uh, those resources and that support. It's important support. It's important. Uh, it's support that's necessary for Delaware families that have been unemployed, uh, Delawareans who've been unemployed have to support their families. We talked earlier today about uh, our rental and, and mortgage assistance programs uh, for just that purpose to help those who are who are unemployed and this these benefits are incredibly important as well and so we would encourage uh, the Congress to act uh, to build on our current system which is uh, not nearly as complicated as this uh, but we don't have uh, the resources right now we're using federal resources for the benefits that are being paid as we speak uh, it's just an unnecessary and complicated way of addressing a real need for the people of Delaware. From Mallory Metzner at WRDE, is there a timeline for phase three yet, and what would it take to get to that point of reopening? Yeah, so the phase three is an interesting uh, challenge for us. Uh, our major objective, as I said earlier on, is to get as many children back in front of teachers and schools as possible, and we're working on that, and their work and school districts are working on that. Many schools, uh, because of concerns over, over uh, safety and uh, some of the restrictions, operational restrictions, have cho chosen uh, to go with uh, fully remote uh, learning. Other districts, like Hip Penlope, in which we highlighted today, have a mix, a so-called hybrid model of a mix of remote and in-person instruction. And we want to continue to have that movement from fully remote to a hybrid to fully in-person instruction. And to do that, we have to have conditions on the ground that warrant it. We're almost there and we're getting there. Uh, and so the way to do that is to really lean into the guidance and restrictions on activity uh, that exists. There isn't much that would happen if we went to so-called phase three, uh, any changes, but it would send a signal to folks uh, that you know, frankly, is not the right signal to, to send now, which is we've, we've accomplished our goal to uh, stomp out the virus and uh, we can go back to normal now. So it's really a question of balancing that messaging out, the need to continue on pace, uh, to wear masks, uh, to social distance, to, uh, to stomp down the virus and and uh, enable us to bring children back to schools and businesses uh, more open uh, so that they can uh, get revenue and survive, put people back to work. So we have two, two objectives, uh, reinvigorate the economy and uh, bring children back to school. They're connected. And so that's what uh, will guide our decisions with respect to the remaining reopening that has to occur. And most of that is around you know, restaurant capacity and uh, gatherings and places that are at the greatest risk of tr uh, transmitting uh, the virus in our, in our communities. From Kate Tabling at Delaware Business Times, doctors across the country are hoping for continued measures and insurance reimbursement for telemedicine options. And Delaware has recently lifted more restrictions on telemedicine with a recent bill that you signed. Since many doctors predict the telemedicine will be here to stay, what long-term measures will you and your administration be looking at in terms of telemedicine, as that bill has a sunset provision of July 1st? Yeah, so we've talked about telemedicine in Delaware for years. 
uh, going back to my days as, uh, as Lieutenant Governor when I did a lot of work uh, in health care, health disparities and, and uh, health care costs and small business health insurance uh, and the rest. But uh, in the context of COVID-19 and this pandemic, uh, with the risk of uh, transmitting the virus, uh, telemedicine has been a godsend. And it's been incredibly important to the delivery of healthcare services and getting uh, patients in, in front of uh, physicians safely, particularly primary care physicians, to get a prescription to go and get tested or whatever the case may be. And that's why we, through legislation that I signed, uh, put in place uh, with a sunset uh, certain terms for telemedicine practice here in our state. They will be important practices going forward, and we will look at uh, some of the conditions as that, uh, that need to be addressed in a long-term basis as this, the sunset uh, approaches uh, in July of next year. We also have to take our lead for, for Medicare and Medicaid in terms of reimbursement. As an employer uh, state, the state uh, will uh, establish fees that will pay for telemedicine, and we need to think about how that will work and how it can create efficiencies uh, in the delivery of health care uh, uh, services in our state. And uh, I know it will be an important uh, way of uh, of doing uh, health care uh, services in the future, and we look forward to addressing any issues uh, that occur over the next several months. From Nick Cialino at Delaware Public Media, are many school districts reaching out to the state for guidance in formulating their plans for the fall? Yeah, so one of the things that we've done, and I asked Dr. Rattay to, to comment uh, on it as well, um, back when we were talking about the the conditions under which schools would re reopen uh, partially remote and partially in-person instruction and, and as we move to into the scenario number two uh, the yellow scenario which is a, kind of a hybrid model uh, we assigned uh, individual professionals and experts from the division of public health to work with educators superintendents uh, instructional uh, experts and leaders in the schools and school districts to develop those plans and really to focus on the operational challenges that teachers uh, and schools encounter with with children and I think that's been really helpful to schools and uh, it's been a way that we've been able to provide uh, real good ad advice to to that decision making. Dr. Rattay? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have uh, received a lot of good feedback. Um, our public health experts who are working with the districts are very busy um, in, in or meaning that the districts um, have um, uh, been spending time working with them, asking questions. And um, I, in fact, received from one particular district some really positive feedback about the experience. They, they are finding it very helpful. So um, uh, we're really glad to be able to support the districts in that way. From Sophia Schmidt at Delaware Public Media, the University of Delaware is requiring all students, faculty, and staff to be tested within 14 days of arriving to campus. What is the state doing to prepare for what will likely be a surge in testing demand? So I'll let AJ uh, handle most of this, but uh, first of all, we're trying to ramp up testing more generally to the public. We talked today about testing all teachers uh, uh, initially before they, they reopen the schools and then periodically through the month, as well as teach, uh, uh, testing uh, students and children in our ele elementary and secondary schools. So that's a big commitment in and of itself. We've got employers, uh, the University of Delaware being chief among them, are bringing uh, uh, students and, and faculty both back uh, on campus and they'll be tested there so we do have big challenges uh, but we also have seen some some innovations in testing technology and, and we're taking advantage of some of that so it'll be a challenge but uh, I think AJ and his team are up to it only thing I would add is, is that is why we keep on looking for you know new labs or new capacity um, but it, it, it's a it's as we look at the school plan. So, you know, we have to hit all these districts at the right time to make that test effective for that school district as they go back. So it's a, uh, 
you know, a map and a logistical lift to make sure we're effective. But, uh, you know, the, the big thing is, is as we get those dates, you know, the farther in advance we have information from whether it's a school district, an employer, University of Delaware, you know, the better we'll be able to accommodate them. Uh, we don't want people to travel, you know, across the county, but we, we also know that we only could be so many places in one day. And then the final questions from Sean Green at WDEL. The DIAA voted last week to suspend sports competition until December. Do you support their decision and do you have any concerns about Delaware high schools not having competition while club sports continue and that this could create a pay to play model in Delaware? Well, first of all, uh, I know how important athletics uh, is to uh, our students and our young people generally as a, as a lifelong athlete and somebody who played uh, three sports in high school and two sports in, in college. And I, I know how important it is uh, to motivate young people to, to do well in school, uh, to go to school in the, in the first place and to, to have a fulfilling life. So I know how, how hard the decision that DIAA made. I appoint a number of the members. Uh, some of the members are uh, appointed to the board uh, by organizations uh, that they represent, uh, be they superintendents, teachers, members of the public. And I know it was a very difficult decision, particularly in light of the fact that uh, many of the high schools, uh, the focus of, of much of the, the sports that DIAA regulates, were going in fully remote, meaning not uh, having in-person in instruction. And so the idea, there are several ideas uh, that they considered uh, weren't able to get a consensus around a lot of that uh, as a result of operational challenges with with busing and with practice and 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 all of that and so I think their decision was based uh, mostly on, on safety and and on the decisions that would be made in states around us uh, our the decision of DIAA was consistent with what we've seen in Pennsylvania Maryland and New Jersey, and so uh, in that, I think they've uh, they've made a good decision going forward. I do think that we we need to look at uh, youth sports. Uh, I'm not sure we're fully comfortable with the way some of the uh, sports uh, tournaments and and competitions are being managed, particularly from uh, the perspective of uh, following appropriate uh, public health guidance, and that, that will be something that that we're looking. Uh, looking at, uh, I know DIAA, I know the athletic directors, the superintendents, parents, teachers and coaches, uh, and concerned uh, members of the public, and uh, frankly, your governor will be eager and interested in getting our students, our young athletes back on the field, back on the courts, uh, enjoying the sports that are so important to uh, their lives. And very difficult decision for DIAA. Um, and uh, I think uh, in light of uh, the situation in each of the school districts with respect to uh, remote learning, uh, the appropriate decision at this time. So with that, uh, as the final question, again, I want to thank everybody for, for joining us today to, for following uh, the press conference uh, and most importantly for uh, what you're doing to help us flatten the, the spread of the curve, flatten, uh, reduce the spread of the virus. COVID-19 in our state, it's still here among us, and so we need to be smart, we need to get tested. Even if you're not uh, feeling sick uh, f with flu-like symptoms, make sure you continue to, to uh, wash your hands and, and sa use sanitizer. And most importantly, uh, wear a, f a face covering, a mask. When you're in public, uh, avoid large gatherings uh, where people are bunched close together. When you're in a, in a gym or at a, a youth sports event, uh, be it a little league game or a, or a summer league basketball game, making sh make sure you're wearing your mask and and keeping uh, within five, uh, six feet of other fans and and uh, and your uh, and your ball players. And if we do all these things, then we're going to be get to where we want to be and have our children back in school and our businesses back online. Thank you for uh, joining us, and we look forward to seeing you the next time.